Hello, welcome to this talk on peripartum cardiomyopathy. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is a rare pregnancy-associated myocardial disease characterized by the development of left ventricular systolic dysfunction as well as symptoms of heart failure. Although this disease is pretty rare, the incidence is increasing and it may be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to understand the diagnostic criteria for peripartum cardiomyopathy, or PPCM, learn some of the associated risk factors as well as the clinical presentation of PPCM, describe some of the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms of the disease, as well as summarize the principles of diagnosis and management. First, let's go over the definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's a rare, dilated, and acquired cardiomyopathy associated with pregnancy, and there are four diagnostic criteria. One, the development of heart failure in the last month of pregnancy or within five months of delivery. Two, absence of another identifiable cause of the heart failure. Three, absence of recognizable heart disease in the last month of pregnancy. And finally, objective evidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction usually as defined by ECHO as an ejection fraction of less than 45%. PPCM is distinct from other forms of heart failure in that it's highly variable from patient to patient. It can sometimes rapidly progress to end-stage heart failure within days and have a high mortality rate, or it can even spontaneously resolve with patients recovering completely. So what causes peripartum cardiomyopathy? Well, the precise mechanism that leads to this disease is still unknown, but many potential pathophysiological mechanisms have been proposed, although none of these have really been proven. Some of the potential causes are listed here and include inflammation, viral myocarditis, an abnormal immune response to pregnancy, hormones, genetics, malnutrition, an abnormal response to the hemodynamic burdens of pregnancy, as well as apoptosis. Stress-activated immune responses have been implicated in the development of PPCM, as studies have shown an increase in inflammatory cytokines, such as APO1, C-reactive protein, and interferon gamma in women with PPCM. Ventricular biopsy of women with this disease have also shown the presence of lymphocytic infiltrates, myocyte edema, necrosis, and fibrosis, suggesting that inflammation is a key player. However, the rise in inflammatory cytokines may be attributed to viral myocarditis or abnormal immunological activities in pregnancy. One such example would be microchimerism. Microchimerism occurs when fetal cells of hematopoietic origin are introduced into the maternal circulation. Once there, they elicit an abnormal autoimmune response. Hormones may also play a role in the development of PPCM as the hormones that you'll commonly see rise in pregnancy, such as estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, as well as relaxin, can lead to excessive relaxation of the heart. There may also be a genetic link to PPCM, as a number of reports have shown that women with mothers or sisters with this disease have carried the same diagnosis. Deficiencies in diet particularly of selenium, may predispose to PPCM, but the role of diet remains unclear. The most recent advances have focused on the role of cardiac cathepsin D, which cleaves prolactin, a normal hormone of pregnancy, into a cardiotoxic fragment, which leads to unbalanced oxidative stresses and may have a pro-apoptotic, pro-inflammatory effect. Risk factors for the development of peripartum cardiomyopathy include the usual cardiovascular risk factors that predispose to other forms of heart failure, including advanced age, hypertension, smoking, and diabetes. Risk factors associated with pregnancy include multiparity, multiple gestation pregnancies, malnutrition during pregnancy, as well as a history of preeclampsia or eclampsia. Maternal cocaine abuse or African-American race have also been shown to be independent risk factors for the development of PPCM. The diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy may often be challenging because many of the signs and symptoms of PPCM mimic the symptoms that occur as a result of 
normal physiological changes in pregnancy, such as pedal edema, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. For this reason, the diagnosis of PPCM can often be delayed or even missed altogether. The majority of patients develop symptoms in the first four months following delivery, although they can present much earlier. Physical examination is often significant for tachycardia, tachypnea, and a reduced ability to lie flat because of shortness of breath. Patients may additionally have some of the signs you'll see in other kinds of heart failure, such as increased jugular venous pressure, a displaced apical impulse, right ventricular heave, murmurs of mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, an S3, or pulmonary crackles. It's important to keep in mind that the diagnosis of PPCM is one of exclusion, and care must be taken to exclude other causes of heart failure, such as pre-existing dilated cardiomyopathy, valvular or hypertensive heart disease, congenital heart disease, or pulmonary embolism. Investigations that may aid in diagnosis include electrocardiography, serum brain natriuretic peptide levels, chest x-ray, and cardiac imaging. ECG in patients with PPCM usually demonstrates sinus tachycardia with nonspecific ST T wave changes. However, the ECG may also show evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, or conduction abnormalities such as left bundle branch block. Serum BNP levels don't usually change much during a normal pregnancy, so an elevated BNP level may help in the diagnosis of PPCM. Chest x-rays may show cardiomegaly, pulmonary venous congestion, or pulmonary edema with or without pleural effusions. Cardiac imaging may include echocardiography or cardiac MRI, and these will usually show variable degrees of left ventricular dilation with systolic dysfunction. The principles of treating peripartum cardiomyopathy are similar to treatment of heart failure arising from other causes in that the primary goals are to optimize hemodynamics, provide symptomatic relief, and improve overall long-term outcomes. In general, the treatment of heart failure should follow the most recent guideline recommendations, except that during pregnancy and lactation, drug therapy must be adjusted due to the potential for detrimental effects on the fetus or the lactating infant. As you remember, the standard drug therapy for heart failure includes the use of diuretic agents, IV and oral vasodilators, beta blockers, spironolactone, digoxin, and IV ionotropes. However, during pregnancy, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated, mainly due to the potential for renal agenesis in the developing fetus, but it also has other potential side effects including oligohydramnios, intrauterine growth retardation, and prematurity. Instead, a combination of nitrates and hydralazine should be used as a substitute for ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Beta-1 selective drugs are also preferred during pregnancy, as non-selective beta blockade may facilitate uterine activity via beta-2 blockade and have an anti-tocolytic effect. Now let's talk about the prognosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy. A number of studies have shown that normalization of left ventricular systolic function occurs in over half of women, and when they recover, it usually happens within two to six months of diagnosis. However, the risk of recurrent peripartum cardiomyopathy in future pregnancies is really unknown. Some of the predictors that have been associated with recovery include left ventricular ejection fractions of over 30% at the time of diagnosis, lack of troponin elevation, lower levels of brain natriuretic peptide, absence of left ventricular thrombi, as well as breastfeeding. However, a significant portion of women with peripartum cardiomyopathy go on to develop severe complications, such as persistent left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure that may or may not require transplantation, cardiogenic shock, cardiopulmonary arrest, and thromboembolic complications. There may also be poor associated obstetric and neonatal outcomes. Mortality estimates range somewhere between 6 to 25 percent, 
and death is usually caused by progressive pump failure, arrhythmias, or thromboembolic events. In summary, peripartum cardiomyopathy is defined by the development of left ventricular systolic dysfunction during the last month of pregnancy or within five months of delivery after having excluded other causes of heart failure. The cause of PPCM is unknown, with potential etiologies including inflammatory, genetic, and hormonal mechanisms. Clinical signs and symptoms mimic the normal physiological changes that occur in pregnancy, which sometimes complicates diagnosis. Treatment focuses on optimizing hemodynamics, providing symptomatic relief, and improving overall long-term outcomes.